I was mentioning the the way that you participate uh, as a participant is you can uh, enter your questions into the chat box at any time. I'm Scott Lovett. I'll be monitoring the chat box for the, our presenters today, and they'll go through their talk. And um, if there's a point in time when it seems like it's a good time to insert that question, I'll do it. So on the line today, we have Brian Newland, who's from uh, Fletcher PLLC and Gordon Henry, who's director of the Native American Institute uh, here at the campus of Michigan State University. And with that, I'll turn it over. I think uh, Brian is the speaker at first. Is that right? I, um, yeah. Gordon, uh, I'll let Gordon go first. OK. Sure. Well, I just want to say, Ani, welcome, everyone. Um, as Scott said, my name is Gordon Henry. I'm a professor in the English department here at Michigan State and the director of the Native American Institute for a few more months. Um, this is the first in a sequence of two webinars we will be holding on the Hearth Act. The second will be held at a, later in April as, at a date yet to be determined. I just want to say this webinar is sponsored by the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development and it's uh, being done through the Native American Institute at MSU. And for this and the, the, follow, the webinar that will follow, we received a small grant from NCRCRD to look at the Hearth Act and its impacts in tribal communities. My co-PI on that project is Tim Mazowski, Mazowski at the, the School of Planning, Design, and Construction here at MSU. And Adam Haviland, who's also online, has helped us with uh, some of the survey work and the legwork uh, that will be part of what we discuss in the subsequent webinar. Um, our speaker this afternoon is Brian Newland. Brian is the citizen of the Bay Mills Indian community. He's Anishinaabe, and he's a 2007 graduate of Michigan State University College of Law with a certificate from the Indigenous Law and Policy Center. He has extensive legal and pol policy experience related to Indian country and commercial gaming, Indian land issues, treaty rights, tribal colleges, and energy development. As Scott said, he, he's a, a partner with this Lansing-based firm, Fletcher Law PLLC, and he worked in D.C. on the development of the Hearth Act. We're very fortunate to have him today. Please welcome Brian. Thanks, Brian. All right. Uh, miigwech, Gordon, and uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us this afternoon. Uh, I'm in sunny East Lansing, Michigan. Um, just to give you a, a, a brief bit of background about myself, uh, I appreciate the, the kind introduction, Gordon. Um, I served as a uh, senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary of the Interior uh, at the time the Hearth Act was moving through Congress and um, really was uh, involved in, in land policy at the department, uh, or Indian land policy, excuse me. Um, uh, was very involved in the development of the new BIA leasing regulations as well as the uh, Department of the Interior's position on the Hearth Act and, and um, some of the legislative history. Uh, been very excited to see how it's developed uh, over the past year and a half since it's been in effect. Um, it's uh, it's always fun, I guess, as, as a lawyer. Uh, this is the nerdy side of me coming out. Um, it's always fun to watch uh, new public policy kind of develop. Um, so what I'm planning to do this afternoon is just uh, walk through uh, some of the, the history of Indian leasing policy under, under federal law um, and then uh, note how the Hearth Act has changed that, some of the requirements of the Hearth Act, um, some of the related changes to the BIA's leasing regulations, uh, and then open it up to questions from uh, those of you who are participating this afternoon. Um, so uh, I guess with that, we'll uh, we'll get started. Um, uh, as you can see here, the Hearth Act was signed into law in 2012. Uh, later in 2012, the BIA published uh, its new leasing regulations. Uh, those new regulations were the the most substantial revision to federal Indian leasing regulations in uh, about 50 years. Uh, and they were uh, uh, really went hand in hand as those regulations kind of serve as some of the standards for implementation of the Hearth Act. 
And you see on here as well, uh, that same year, uh, the BIA uh, uh, gained a new categorical exclusion for residential leasing on Indian lands. Uh, what this means is that uh, single-family homes in rights of way on, on these sites that are less than five acres do not have to go through uh, the uh, rigorous NEPA review process under federal law. So uh, the, the upshot of all of these changes uh, is that federal policy shifted to give, I, I hate using that term give, but to put more control in the hands of tribes uh, over their own lands. Um, and the reason I, I, I qualified my use of the term give is that, uh, as many of you know, Indian tribes uh, have the inherent authority to control use of their own lands. So you can really think of these as a uh, relaxation of federal restrictions. Um, to understand the changes that the Hearth Act made, it's, it's important to understand where we came from. Um, for the first hundred years of federal Indian law and federal policy, there was there was no such thing as Indian leasing. Uh, federal law was uh, mostly designed to take Indian lands or dispossess Indian lands, and uh, um, you know there was really no no federal attention given on how to maximize the ability of tribes to use their own lands. Of course, in 1887, Congress passed the General Allotment Act or the Dawes Act which was focused uh, uh, mainly on assimilating tribes and um, uh, I guess uh, putting more property in, in individual private ownership. Um, part of the problem with the General Allotment Act, is, as many of you know, uh, was that A, it resulted in a continued loss of tribal lands, but B, it didn't really uh, free up the ability of tribes to use, and individual Indians to use their own lands uh, in an economically beneficial way. So a couple of years after that, Congress amended the General Allotment Act and passed the first Indian le leasing statute in U.S. history. Um, it allowed leases for a period of three years, and they required approval of the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, at that time, you actually had to get the approval of the Secretary of the Interior. You didn't. Uh, it wasn't good enough to get the local BIA agent to approve your lease. You actually had to get it approved in Washington. Um, with some minor changes, that policy remained in effect for the next 60 years. Uh, Congress kind of toyed around with the length of lease terms. They went from, they fluctuated between three and ten years. Uh, but for the most part, uh, uh, Congress, again, in the United States government, wasn't focused on uh, maximizing the ability of tribes to use their own lands, especially uh, through leasing. Uh, in 1955, Congress uh, passed the Long-Term Leasing Act, which is still in use today. Uh, the Long-Term Leasing Act allows tribes to lease their own lands for up to 25 years, or it initially did, uh, with several periods of uh, renewal. Uh, one of the important things uh, that I like to point out about the Long-Term Leasing Act is that it, it had the effect of actually slowing down the loss of, of Indian lands. Uh, and it did this by uh, freeing up the ability of tribes and, and individual Indians to use their own lands in an economically beneficial way. Uh, it made long-term development projects possible. And if you open up, uh, if you are brave enough or nerdy enough like me to open up the federal statutes, uh, and you look at the Long-Term Leasing Act now, you'll notice uh, one subsection has a list of dozens and dozens of tribes. Uh, and that particular subsection uh, allows those tribes listed to lease their lands for a period of up to 99 years. Uh, for some reason, Congress has not uh, done a comprehensive amendment to allow all tribes to do this. Uh, it's done uh, pretty regularly on a piecemeal basis, adding a few tribes at a time. Um, most importantly for purposes of our discussion today was that the Long-Term Leasing Act uh, kept the secretarial approval requirement. So for tribes to lease their own lands, they still had to get the approval of the Department of the Interior. One thing to understand about the secretarial approval requirement um, is uh, or, you know, we need to know where it came from and why it's there. Uh, it's an outgrowth of the trust relationship between uh, tribes and the federal government, where 
the federal government is supposed to look out for the best interests of tribes and protect them uh, sometimes uh, from their own decision making as uh, you know some people uh, would say uh, but the approval requirement was also intended to protect the Secretary of the Interior uh, from liability uh, the Secretary or the Department of the Interior owns the underlying fee title of Indian lands uh, under federal law uh, and so anything that would encumber those lands or restrict those lands or obligate those lands um, it could potentially put the secretary in a position of liability for damages um, so you have to get uh, the secretary's approval to encumber those lands in 1970 Congress uh, amended the long-term leasing act um, to carve out an exception to the secretarial approval requirement. This was the first time that this happened uh, under federal law was for the Tulalip tribes in Washington. Uh, they could, uh, under that law, they could lease without secretarial approval for up to 15 years. Um, and if they, had a, if they were to approve their own regulations or develop their own regulations, uh, they could do leasing for up to 30 years. Um, importantly, their uh, uh, their exception or their waiver of the secretarial approval requirement um, doesn't include leases for uh, quote the exploitation of any natural resource so timber leasing or minerals leasing um, it also importantly is there's no environmental review requirement under that uh, for those of you who may be from the Northwest or are familiar with the Tulalip tribes um, they've been able to parlay this uh, feature of law to uh, significant economic development uh, commercial real estate development on their own lands um, more recently in, in 2000 Congress uh, carved out a similar exception for the Navajo Nation um, the provisions uh, of, of that act actually are a little more comprehensive than than what they were for Tulalip uh, and actually the Hearth Act is based on this 2000 Navajo Nation law uh, under that act the uh, tribes leasing regulations have to be approved by the secretary they can uh, lease their lands under tribal law uh, for business or agriculture um, for up to 25 years uh, 75 years for housing or public purposes um, importantly it only includes tribal lands, so individual allotments are not subject to uh, uh, the Navajo Nation's uh, own leasing authority and those regulations have to provide for environmental review and also as you see on the slide here the Secretary of the Interior is not liable uh, to the Navajo Nation for any losses that that result uh, from a lease here you see there is President Obama signing the Hearth Act in, in 2012 with uh, um, the congressional co-sponsors uh, Senator Akaka and, and uh, then Congressman Martin Heinrich over his shoulder now a senator from New Mexico uh, the key feature of the Hearth Act is that uh, it essentially allows tribes to opt out of the secretarial approval requirement for leasing tribal lands uh, this is a, a first in the history of federal Indian law and as I like to point out um, the Hearth Act doesn't give tribes anything that they didn't already have instead it restores their inherent authority over the use and development of their own lands so uh, for the next couple of slides I'm going to cover the, the the key points of the Hearth Act uh, to opt in tribes have to first adopt their own leasing regulations or their own leasing statutes those statutes must be approved by the Secretary of the Interior so when you uh, as a tribe uh, tribal council develops uh, tribal leasing statute uh, to cover uh, surface leasing on tribally owned lands uh, it doesn't cover individual lands uh, you submit those to the Department of the Interior then they have 120 days to review those regulations and approve them um, as you see here this is only uh, it doesn't cover mineral estate and uh, it's limited to tribally owned trust lands and, and uh, individuals can't take advantage of this law um, these are really the only requirements of the Hearth Act here the tribal regulations uh, have to be quote consistent with the BIA's leasing regulations and the reason I quoted uh, the word consistent in the slide is uh, the statute uses that term it does not use uh, 
what are what's called a meet or exceed standard. So uh, this is important um, for tribal councils that are developing their own leasing laws because they don't have to cut and paste the BIA's leasing regulations. They don't have to impose uh, stricter standards. They just have to be consistent with the BIA's leasing regulations. Uh, that that allows tribal governments to have a lot of flexibility in shaping their own legal pol or, uh, leasing policy. Tribal regulations also have to establish an environmental review process for leases. So what this means is that uh, uh, tribal law has to ensure that that the the process identifies significant environmental effects from uh, particular leases, that the public has an opportunity to uh, be on notice of any particular lease and comment on its environmental impacts, and tribal regulations have to respond to uh, substantive public comments. Uh, you see on the slide here at the bottom, I, I, I noted that NEPA doesn't apply to tribal leasing under the Hearth Act. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, uh, Bureau speak, NEPA stands for the National Environmental Policy Act. And uh, um, what that does is requires environmental re review whenever the federal government is making a decision. Uh, so, for example, the BIA is considering um, whether to approve a, a lease of tribal land. Um, NEPA applies in that instance because there's a federal decision involved. As the Hearth Act was going through Congress, um, there was a lot of talk amongst members of Congress about whether to extend NEPA to tribal leasing decisions under the Hearth Act. Um, those of us in the administration uh, uh, were opposed to that and explained that the intent of the Hearth Act was to uh, restore tribal control over their own lands and promote economic development, and it didn't make sense to roll back federal authority in one area and extend it in another area because uh, NEPA does not apply to tribal governments uh, and uh, that view ended up carrying the day so in place of NEPA uh, is this language that you see here that tribes have to develop their own environmental review process it, in it, it includes some provisions that are consistent with NEPA but NEPA doesn't apply this is a tribal process and that cuts down uh, on the timeline for leasing review uh, significantly. After the Hearth Act passed, the the BIA said, "Well, now the now the burden is going to be on us to review these. We have 120 days to review tribal leasing regulations, so uh, we got to provide some guidance to tribes so they know what we're going to look at." Um, so they published this guidance memorandum. It's available uh, at the link here on this slide. And uh, it acknowledges, again, uh, I have to point out that the BI's guidance acknowledges that tribal regulations only have to be consistent with BI regulations. They don't have to meet or exceed them. Uh, that guidance lists the subjects uh, that tribal leasing regulations have to address, but it doesn't prescribe how tribes have to address them. So, for instance, uh, the guidance might indicate that tribal leasing regulations should address who owns an improvement on leased lands. Um, the guidance does not require tribes to adopt the BIA standards, it just requires tribes to address that, even if it's only to say we're not going to address this particular topic. Um, certain uh, provisions from the BIA's leasing regulations are, are mandatory in tribal leasing regulations, and those are mostly definitions of key terms to ensure that the tribes and the BI are on the same page when they're talking about, um, you know, what is the definition of a permanent improvement? What is the definition of a possessory interest? See on this slide, um, this is what I think is the the most beneficial part of the Hearth Act is the flexibility that it uh, affords tribes. Tribal leasing regulations under Hearth Act are not an all-or-nothing proposition. So, uh, for example, uh, a, a tribe can enact a Hearth Act ordinance that says we are going to take over uh, control of leasing, but only for housing purposes. Uh, so all housing leases under the tribe's law would be approved by the tribal government. 
business leases, agricultural leases, etc., would remain under the BIA's process. So this allows uh, tribes to take back as much uh, leasing control as they have the capacity to handle or the desire. Uh, you can designate a particular area of uh, tribal lands as subject to the Hearth Act. Uh, so for example, uh, you could say, a tribe could say, uh, Parcel X, uh, we want to promote economic development there, so we're going to do our own leasing on that portion of the reservation. Everywhere else will remain under the BIA's leasing process. Uh, and importantly, you see this last point here on the slide. Uh, even where tribes have taken back all of their leasing authority under the Hearth Act, uh, you can su they can still submit leases for approval uh, by the BI under the BI's own leasing regulations. I use the Navajo Nation as an example of this, where they have had their own leasing statute uh, for a period of years, but yet were attempting to develop a coal-fired power plant on their own lands. Uh, it was a very complex transaction, uh, lots of actors, lots of money involved, uh, and they wanted that lease to uh, be subjected to the BIA's process rather than their own. Um, every, coin, every coin has two sides, though. Uh, the Hearth Act does have some limitations. Uh, uh, most notably is the fact that the federal government uh, uh, is no longer liable for for any losses that that are result from a tribal approval of a tribal lease so for example if uh, you have a tribe that approves a lease for a business deal the deal goes bad uh, the tribe can't look to the Department of the Interior uh, to cover them uh, for their losses there's no more breach of the trust responsibility the uh, you know, self-determination includes the, the freedom to make a bad deal or the right to make a bad deal and the federal government is, is steps away from liability there where the tribe has uh, enacted its own laws. Um, the second one here, the Secretary of the Interior has authority to review whether a tribe's complied with its own leasing regulations. Um, that has the potential to put the Department of the Interior in a position to uh, interpret tribal laws which I know uh, may make uh, some uh, tribal attorneys or tribal leaders uh, uncomfortable. Uh, the secretary can enforce the terms of any lease under tribal leasing regulations and the secretary has the ultimate authority to rescind approval of tribal leasing regulations if uh, the department determines that there's um, the tribe has, has not been following its own laws. Uh, there aren't really a whole lot of standards spelled out for uh, when and whether that can occur or when and how, excuse me. Um, here's a bit of advice I, I would offer to uh, tribal leaders and practitioners in, in trying to develop tribal leasing laws under the Hearth Act. One is to um, take your time in, in spelling out your environmental review process. Uh, the Hearth Act doesn't define the scope of the public that is entitled to notice and comment. There's, uh, the word public is not defined in the Hearth Act. So uh, you can envision a scenario where a tribe might define public as everybody in the United States or all tribal members residing on the reservation and anything in between. Um, this is a potential uh, point of litigation. So for example, uh, I, you might be able to envision a scenario where <coughs> tribe is uh, promoting or, or proposing a, a large development project under a lease. Uh, neighboring community gets really upset. They're saying they didn't have an opportunity to uh, uh, receive notice and comment on that on that development and the tribe statute defines public as uh, individuals living within the reservation. Uh, you know, the, something like that can trigger litigation under the Hearth Act so uh, you know it, how tribes want to define this is is ultimately it's up to them and that's their right I just would recommend taking care and in, in making sure that this process is clearly defined uh, when you're developing Hearth Act regulations under tribal law um, on that point the Hearth Act requires the BIA to offer technical assistance in the development development of an environmental review process and then uh, as of today uh, Hearth Act uh, ordinances are submitted to the BIA's central office in Washington, D.C. I believe the Assistant Secretary is uh, the ultimate approval authority right now, but 
I do understand that they are planning to delegate that authority out to the BIA's 12 regional offices. So at some point in the near future, uh, these regulations will be submitted to the regional offices for approval. Again, here you see some of the benefits of the Hearth Act are restoring tribal control over tribal lands. Uh, this is a first in the history of federal law. Um, it reduces the cost for leasing. So again, this is one way that it would promote economic development. Uh, tribes have more control of the time frames for lease review. Uh, federal environmental laws don't apply, and that uh, in turn lowers the transaction costs and, and leads to hopefully more economic development. You see here on this slide is a list of uh, the 12 tribes that have had uh, uh, Hearth Act regulations approved by the Department of the Interior. Uh, you know, some of them range in, in scope and coverage. Uh, Pueblo of Sandia, I believe, has uh, approved regulations uh, for business leasing. Um, Great and Rancheria is the same. I, I believe it's actually for leasing on their uh, current gaming parcel. Uh, and some others have, have much broader leasing authority. And I, and I also believe that uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary Washburn uh, approved four of these just last week. So this list is growing. I wanted to touch on very briefly before uh, we open this up to questions uh, the changes in the BIA's leasing regulations um, at uh, uh, 25 CFR Part 162. Uh, again, I mentioned at the top that, that these are the most comprehensive changes to Indian leasing in the last 50 years. Uh, or the BIA's Indian leasing regulations. Uh, they only apply to surface leases, so again they don't cover water or, or mineral leases. Um, they establish different processes for different types of leases, so those of you familiar with this before, you had agricultural leasing and then everything else. Uh, so you could have a coal-fired power plant as would have been subjected to the same uh, scrutiny as a, a lease for a house. Uh, under the new regulations, it breaks it out into housing, leases, agriculture, business, and renewable energy, each with its own process and timelines. Uh, the rules don't get rid of the secretarial approval requirement, but they do impose for the first time uh, time limits uh, for the BI to complete its lease review. Uh, I, I often use the story about my parents. It took them uh, about eight years to get their lease and their mortgage approved by the BIA before we could finally move into our house when I was younger. Uh, under the new regulations, that, that process is limited to 30 days. Uh, for subleases, uh, they automatically uh, become approved uh, if the BIA doesn't complete its review in, in the prescribed time period. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, for this part, uh, the new regulations kind of shift the burden of proof on lease approvals. Before, if you were an Indian landowner, you had to prove to the BIA why the lease uh, was in your own best interest. Here, under the new regulations, the BIA has the burden of showing why it's not. That means if, if the BIA can't come up with a, a reason why the lease is not in your best interest and there's only a, a short list of reasons why it can make that finding, then the lease uh, needs to be approved. Um, here's some other features of the new BI leasing regulations. Uh, the BI can do a, a, a NEPA review before, um, or excuse me, can review the lease before NEPA review is completed. Again, this uh, is intended to shorten the timeline. Um, it allows for direct pay, so instead of uh, somebody, the lessee making a payment to the BIA who then cuts the check, you know, many years later, many months later to the landowners uh, where there are 10 or fewer landowners involved, uh, the lessee can, can pay directly uh, their rent. Um, you, you see here it incorporates consent requirements. So this is a, a, this would apply where a parcel of land is owned by multiple people and uh, they all have to consent to approve to have that land leased out. Um, uh, and then these last two are, are really um, intended to get again at economic development. Um, 
there, it was questionable under federal law whether tribes could, could provide for tribal preference in employment. Uh, Indian preference, of course, has been allowed uh, for the past 40 or 50 years, but tribal preference uh, um, was an open question and it was subject to some litigation uh, at Navajo and Hopi. Uh, these new regulations say that where you have a lease, you can specify in the lease that there uh, will be tribal preference in employment. And lastly, these new regulations uh, clarify the tax status of land, so they preempt state and local taxes. Uh, for example, you have lots of places where uh, counties and cities come in and they say, hey, we're going to levy a, um, a personal property tax on, you know, on your shed or your garage, or uh, we're going we're gonna to tax the leasehold interest or any business activities uh, on that land. These regulations uh, uh, say now, no, that's preempted. The federal government has a strong interest in tribal economic development, and there's no room for state and local taxation. Uh, this is currently subject to litigation. Um, uh, the Chehalis tribe in Washington State um, won an appeal uh, on, a, on a case involving this, where the federal court uh, essentially said that these regulations only confirm what was already known is that federal law preempts state and local taxes uh, and then there's also some uh, some lawsuits in Southern California that are going to deal with this issue as well. So again here I'm highlighting uh, just some of the different subparts or the new processes under the BI's leasing regulations. Uh, the residential process applies to housing and, and single-family homes, housing for public purposes. Um, Business leasing applies to business, commercial development, uh, religious, educational, recreational, or other public purposes. And then wind and solar energy leasing is uh, pretty self-explanatory. So uh, that I'll quit talking now and uh, um, open this up to any questions. I think uh, uh, if I if I remember right, Gordon, they, they just type it in the chat bar and... Um, I'll read the question to the group and then uh, uh, answer it the best I can. And I appreciate uh, everybody for logging in this afternoon and uh, taking the time today. Yeah, thanks a lot. A great uh, presentation. And I maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think I recognize somebody in that picture with President Obama. <laughs> um, was, it, uh, uh, was it Cheryl, Cheryl Cosley from Bay Mills? <laughs> no. Um, so uh, I had a couple questions while we're we're um, uh, letting the others chime in. Uh, first, you know, it's a great great presentation and uh, looks like a really wonderful opportunity for tribes to have a little more uh, say in, in um, you know, kind of moving moving things along and, and uh, making use of their, their lands. I was curious as to uh, you know was there particular thinking behind. Um, the, the exclusion of mineral rights in this initiative. Um, yes, uh, for for those of you who are familiar with uh, Indian law, um, mineral leasing is done under separate statutes as uh, uh, than surface leasing, uh, and I think that's part of this grand scheme to make uh, Indian law as complicated as possible. Um, so there are uh, there's really one surface leasing statute. For the most part, uh, and there are multiple mineral leasing statutes. Some tribes have their own mineral law statutes, uh, and it would have just been uh, uh, much more complex to deal with, and uh, brought in more interests uh, uh, to bear against any any proposed reforms. Um, I believe the uh, uh, Energy Policy Act, I want to say 2005, uh, did make some some changes to mineral leasing on Indian lands. It, it was intended to be similar to the Hearth Act uh, in allowing tribes to, or restoring their ability to control leasing, but it it hasn't worked out as well. Um, to my knowledge, no tribes have taken advantage of that authority because of uh, the complexities, and then there's some standards that they have to adhere to that uh, really don't work. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I see here a, a question about uh, um, whether uh, uh, leasing uh, uh, under a HUD 184 mortgage uh, 
or leasing tribal land with a, a HUD 184 mortgage will bring NEPA into play. Uh, as I understand Hearth Act, and as, as, as we were, you know, going through the process of developing it, the intent was to, to get the feds uh, out of the picture. So where tribes, uh, tribes are leasing their own lands um, under Hearth, that uh, federal environmental review wouldn't apply. They would only have to uh, subject the lease to tribal environmental review. Uh, there's a question about how to access the presentation after the web webinar. I believe it's going to be emailed. Um, uh, no, well, it's 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 going to be posted at the the website that's listed in blue down at the bottom. Uh, so it's in the, on the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development uh, website, so that you, folks can plug into the recording there. Uh, they'll also be able to download the PowerPoint slides as just a regular file. Um, it could be that others would email that link around, but that's where you would get the original link. I also wanted to mention that uh, we do have the evaluation up, so if folks wanted to click through that, that would be great. Um, but, um, Ryan, go ahead and answer sure. Tara. Question. Yeah, the um, if for everybody who can't see this, the uh, the question is: Does Hearth Act define renewable energy as only solar and wind? Um, it, you know, this is a this is a a point of confusion. I think for a lot of people, this differentiating between the Hearth Act and the BI's leasing regulations. So the Hearth Act doesn't define renewable energy at all. Uh, it's it's a very short statute. If you um, pull it up online and read it, it it's two pages uh, and it, it doesn't specify any particular type of lease other than to say surface leasing of tribally owned lands uh, so it doesn't address renewable energy now the BI's revised leasing regulations do address renewable energy uh, and those are uh, limited to solar and wind development uh, you're absolutely correct uh, we looked at again Going back to George, Gordon's question, we looked at uh, <clears throat> whether to include other types of renewable energy development in those leasing regulations and uh, you know, geothermal and, and waste to energy and, and um, hydroelectric, and they didn't really fit under the statutory authority that we were operating under. So I hope that answers your question, Tara. Great. Looks like uh, we have got other people typing. Um, so while they're typing, I'll uh, I'll ask for a couple more here. Um, first, are the uh, BIA approved? Uh, I think there were ten or twelve tribes that were already approved. Um, are are those posted anywhere? If uh, other tribes want to see some templates of what's done, been done. I don't. Uh, I don't believe that they are, Gordon. I. I um, somebody can correct me if if you know differently, but I don't think that they've put those tribal regulations up uh, on the BIA's website now. Whether those particular tribes have have posted their new laws, I can't tell you. Uh, I, I would think that that information would be subject to FOIA if you really wanted them uh, to go that route. Um, but again, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, I see it. So, would there be reasons for the tribes to not want that public? I mean, you know, it seems like that might help the other tribes. You know, I, I, I again, I, I can't. I, I don't know where there would be proprietary information contained in leasing regulations, but uh, to the extent that that there was, I can see a reason for keeping it, um, you know, keeping it close to the vest, but. Um, you know, uh, uh, on the flip side of that coin, uh, you know, I'm sure that there are groups out there that um, just generally don't uh, are opposed to um, tribes regaining control over, especially when you, when we're talking about land, which is really at the heart of a lot of Indian law disputes. Um, it, they might watch for tribal leasing regulations and, and you know pinpoint them, but. Again, I, I'm biased here, but I think that the, the pros outweigh the cons. I see a, another question from uh, from Dick about the uh, HUD 184 program. Um, uh, I guess that um, Dick is asking, um, 
The intent of the question was to get at whether combining a federal program with a hearth lease brings NEPA into play because of the federal program, not via hearth. Uh, again, I, uh, Dick, I don't believe that uh, that's the case. Is uh, that a lease under tribal law uh, isn't subject to NEPA? Now, I think under uh, under the HUD program, there is a separate environmental review. Um, I'm, I'm less well versed in, in that, um, but I, uh, again, I think the intent with Hearth was to to get out completely from federal review process. And Dick just posted another another question uh -huh. for you. So, all right, yeah, there's a. Um, I think that was the Indian Land Tenure Foundation uh, had a recent uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, regarding the Hearth Act, and, uh, and you know, Mr. Todd points out that they uh, they passed out templates of uh, tribal leasing regulations. Um, oh, cool. I know that they, they do hey, good Brian, work there. Brian, at this point, Brian, I had a question. This is Gordon. Um, can you think of any ways tribes have used this uh, in ways we might not have thought of more creatively so far um, in terms of how trust land is uh, is designated or divided up or something like that? Well, I mean, I, I think that the entire thing is new. So, um, uh, you know, I... Again, this is this is limited to leasing, um, so it doesn't really affect the fee to trust process too much. It's more, uh, you know, who has the authority over the land once it's been put into trust, um, you know. But I think that you're gonna, I think you're gonna see tribes really looking at this and, uh, you know, in an effort to spur um, economic development on their own lands, especially, you know, there are tribes that are located um, near urban areas, whether it's Albuquerque or Phoenix or Seattle or um, even even smaller urban areas than that, that um, the opportunity is there for commercial real estate. Um, so, I, you know, I think you'll have tribes look at that. I know that, um, uh, for example, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community down near Phoenix has a they're also really into commercial real estate with, uh, you know, strip malls and office uh, complexes and the like. Okay. Uh, you, uh, you and Gordon mentioned that uh, there's a plan for a, a follow-up webinar. Do you want to give a little preview of that, what topics might be covered in the next one? Yeah, I could talk a little bit about that, Scott. Um, as you know, we've submitted a proposal for a small grant uh, for this project, and this is the first webinar. And this one, we just wanted to introduce sort of the topic and and have an expert talk about it. And that was Brian in the picture that the president was signing, by the way. He's too. He's, he's just too uh, uh, bashful, isn't he? Modest. Too modest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he even stood the farthest away, I guess, too. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, and, what we would plan on doing is. Um, We've sent out we've sent out surveys and we we are going to do some some phone interviews with with tribes and uh, present findings uh, in the second webinar and and uh, that that includes sort of a review of what literature we we could find so far and so that will be uh, what we do is sort of present uh, an overview of the overall project in the next webinar uh, at the end of the project. Well, excellent. Okay. I think I'm looking forward to that next one. Our, uh, looks like Dick is maybe typing one more question, uh, but maybe not. So uh, well, I see a lot of friends, uh, uh, or a few friends of mine on the attendee list, the uh, people I know. So um, uh, I appreciate everybody who joined this afternoon and taking the time. And um, my email address is on, uh, and my phone number as well is on the, the slideshow here. And, um, I certainly welcome anybody reaching out to me if you have uh, questions or or even ideas. I don't uh, I don't claim to have a monopoly on the uh, on this subject, but I'm very interested in it. So if you're hearing things, uh, uh, um, you know, Dick and and others that uh, are of note, please uh, let me know, and I'm happy to work with any of you. And I'm very grateful that you participated today. It looks like Dick has one last question. 
question. Yeah, um, uh, yeah Dick's question is uh, about uh, setting up a tribal land office and, and getting TAMS access. Uh, you know, TAMS. <laughs> now we're really into the into the weeds here of. Uh, um, you know the bowels of the BIA, but uh, TAMS is the the software system that the bureau uses, called the Tribal Asset uh, Accounting and Management System, um, it, and that tracks uh, leases and all sorts of real estate um, documents. And uh, um, I guess that's a that's a point that I didn't cover in the presentation today. But <laughs> leases uh, that are approved under a Hearth Act still have to be recorded at. Uh, BIA's Land Titles and Records Office. Um, uh, again, the secretary again has to be, uh, you know, for better or for worse, has to be on no notice of uh, how the land is being encumbered. Um, and uh, you know, certainly getting access to TAMS is, uh, uh, I imagine, would be very helpful. Um, I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, hoops to jump through for that, if I recall right. But uh, um, it's a very <laughs> Uh, I think Dick's expertise on, on, on kind of the minutia of that stuff uh, is far exceeds my own. But um, I would think that if you can get your own real estate office uh, um, and get 638 funding for it, uh, and then you know have access to all the recording uh, tools, that that would be very very helpful to uh, taking greater control of, of tribal land development. Well, excellent. I want to thank uh, all of our participants and especially our two presenters and also Adam and Tim who were uh, present but uh, weren't speaking for all the assistance and uh, putting together a great presentation. Thank you, Scott. Brian. Well, thanks again, everybody, and I hope you uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, wait, we have one more question. We'll take this. I guess we oh, can take maybe. this last one. It's fine with me. Oh, never mind. Sure, let's keep going now. Oh, just to thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your time.